Welcome to Microscope Club. So uh, we'll start off uh, uh, by handing over to um, Paul Palmer, um, who's going to introduce today's topic. And um, what have you got for us, Paul? <coughs> uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, could everybody else turn their microphone off? Because I don't think everybody, yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, the, the topic for today was, uh, we, we called it handling specimens. And rarely this came from the, um, uh, the, the, the need for specimens sometimes to be collected and then uh, identified. And it, I was particularly thinking um, about moth specimens, but this obviously also applies to uh, um, uh, other groups. Now, I'm one of the people in the county who receive uh, specimens of moth uh, for dissection and um, sometimes not all the specimens I get are actually in a suitable state for dissection so it's um, and I, I don't want to appear grumpy here because I think sometimes I can come a bit grumpy uh, it sound a bit grumpy because um, of basically how badly some of the specimens have been presented. So let's start by having a look at a, a beautifully prepared specimen that, that I prepared uh, earlier. And what you can see here is going to be a bit out of focus. And I'm going to switch over to the microscope. What I've got is really the, the perfect way to present your moth specimens to me for dissection. And that is nicely killed, dried and set. Well, I'm not expecting everybody to be able to set the specimen, but if we just go through the, 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 the process, you'll understand why um, it, it's, it's so important to um, present the specimen nicely. Can I share uh, my screen now, uh, please? Um, or have I got, oh, great. So what we've got here, uh, share. Um, and if I do a little bit of um, focusing, what I've done, I put this specimen under a microscope. And I'm sure that if I focus it now, I'm sure that what you can see is that I, I've got a plume moth. And it's very clearly one of just two species of uh, plume moth. The, um, the brindled plume or the beautiful plume. And this one's actually a, um, uh, a beautiful plume. And what I need to sort of emphasize here, yes, get it on minimum magnification. You notice that I've got a couple of labels uh, attached. Um, one label you can see is actually, it's my details, it's the, the specimen. And the other label well, on a much bigger card underneath um, has actually got some bits glued to it. And that's the, um, the dissected bits of the moth that are used to confirm the, the identification. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this, you can see that this is quite a lot of labeling. And then if I were to prepare a microscope slide, and now I'll put one of those on here. And if I zoom down, we've got the, the bits here. This is the bits that we would use. And what we've done is um, you, uh, we've snipped off the abdomen. We popped it in a test tube. And then what we would do, I'm just looking around for a piece of paper. When it goes into the test tube, we pop out another little label and in fact we do two labels one stays with the specimen and one goes in the test tube so you're getting the idea here there's an awful lot of labeling goes on and then eventually we turn it into a slide and if i zoom up on the details of the slide um, uh, here we go and we get the the bits that we need to confirm the identification and I could zoom up further 
and the bits that we actually need to confirm this identification uh, are, uh, I'll turn the brightness up a little bit. So here we are. That's it, and put that back. The bits that we need to confirm the identification are those little like thorn pieces on the edge of the wing. So you can see a couple of uh, quite sharp thorns. There we go. And uh, see if I can get it even closer. Oh yeah. We can see those, those thorn-like structures confirm the, the species. And then after that, I um, either glue the bits back to the card, or if it's a microscope, I'm going to zoom out again. Um, I actually have two labels. Uh, let's change the, I, I, I never use auto because the, the brightness um, varies so much. Uh, here we are, and I've got two labels uh, on, on the slide. Actually, I'll show you like this, two labels on the, on the slide, and um, they label the slide up. And then to actually report the, uh, the findings to the county recorder, I have yet more labels that get stuck to a sheet and then we scan that sheet and send that to Adrian. And if I've made a permanent slide up, I also have a log book. So you kind of get the idea that there's an awful lot of labeling goes on, which is why you should only put one specimen per tube or anything like that, however you're going to collect it. The number of times that I see um, four or five specimens in a tube, it's, um, it, it, it's not, not irritating. It first means, the first thing I have to do is separate everything out, copy all the labels, so I've got one, one per. So, you know, you're, you're asking volunteers to do the dissection for you, and the first job when people have put several things per slide, uh, per, per you know, carrier, is that we've got to do an awful lot of labelling before we can even get to the dissection bit. Now the, the, the next problem is for a lot of people is if you're not going to do the um, uh, pin and somebody said to me, never, don't know how you actually pin. Well what we have are things like this. This is a little setting board and this is a little group of micro moths I've been collecting through the year. And what I've done, I've peeled them, pinned them. And again, you will see lots and lots of labeling going on. And then each of these later on will be dissected. I'm not really expecting anybody to ever have to do that. Although if you wanted to, we, we, we could actually um, do that as a session. But what I would really want to do is say, yeah, kill the specimen, Freezing is the easiest method, but um, I use, I actually use a, 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 a triple method. I first of all gas them with CO2 so they don't move. I, I then pop them in a killing jar with ethyl acetate that immob uh, immobilizes and kills the, um, the specimens. If you leave it in there too long, they, they go rigid. I then set them and then I put them in the freezer uh, for at least 24 hours um, and that makes sure they're, they're killed and that way I get these perfect specimens to dissect. Now what a lot of people do, do is give them in containers, little plastic containers and they just pop them in uh, with a label which is great actually and then um, uh, they give them to me. The trouble is is that that works quite well for micro moths, especially, he says, looking around if you have a very, really small uh, plastic container. That works well because the micro moths don't have very much moisture in them. But the big moths, they've, they've got a lot, a lot of um, uh, fluid in them. Uh, there's chat there. What kind of glue do I use? Glue, okay. He reaches over for a glue which is going to be around here somewhere. Uh, 
Hercules, Hercules glue, which is a, um, it's a PVA glue and you can buy it from entomological suppliers. I actually buy mine from um, Czechoslovakia, would you believe, uh, Ente Sphinx, because um, they, 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 they seem to stock it and they're quite happy to export to the UK. Um, other PVA glues would work, but um, this stuff really seems to stick the bodies on um, uh, well. Um, but I was say, uh, saying about a lot of moisture in the, um, uh, in the bigger moss. So a little tube works perfectly for the micros. And I know the guys who dissect the micro moss are quite happy like that. I, I, I'm happy to dissect the micro moss as well. And I'm, I'm happy with them like that because the, the point I really want to emphasize is that we don't actually just look at the... Uh, genitalia, the, bit, the, the tip of the abdomen, we actually look at the whole moth to get the ID. So I, I showed you um, that beautiful plume and said, well, you know, got it down to two species already. Um, and if the specimen is too badly damaged, then you can't see all the features. So what happens on the big moths is that they start to kind of rot inside the, um, the tube and um, uh, a sort of like black fungal hyphae start growing through everything. And it can completely obscure the specimen. So, or you can dissect it. It's a really unpleasant job though. Um, and you can't see the color of the wings because they've all rotted away and turned black. And this is a bit where I don't want to sound too grumpy, but I've now said, if any come to me like that, I simply will throw them away. I, I can't work with those. So it's important to dry them. So killing them in a test uh, in a freezer is absolutely fine, but you then got to dry the, um, the specimens. I suppose you could just take the top off for a week in your airing cupboard or something, but a more traditional method is, um, papering. And if you look at an old book, you will see, um, they say, oh yeah, paper the specimen. So once you've killed them, you get a little square of paper and you fold it into a triangle and you label the edges. And this one, uh, Palmer's Ford, Tilly Lamp, 18th of the 8th, 82. So <laughs> 38 years ago, I, I took this and I never quite got round to, to doing anything with it. And I didn't know what it was. It's a, a yellow shell as, um, uh, as well. But I've got a, a few more specimens that uh, are probably more interesting than that. Now the point is, is that this was done with greaseproof paper. Uh, baking parchment um, is equally as useful. And some of you will know that I'm quite keen cook anyway. So we've got lots of bacon parchment and stuff laying around. But this is actually a really nice way to present the macro moss because I can easily unwrap it and then I can uh, look at the specimen if I wanted to. It's possible to actually set a specimen. There's a way of moistening these, these things. So this is a really nice way to um, present them. And if you're not so good at origami, you can also buy little glassine envelopes. Now, people as old as me will remember we used to get our pay in glassine envelopes. It used to, there used to be a paper envelope and the pound notes were wrapped up in glassine. Um, and glassine is the really lovely non-stick paper that's used in old style photograph albums. Museums use it a lot. It's, um, it's a really nice material, but because it's got an adhesive edge, um, you can well write on it before you pop a specimen in, uh, label it up, seal it up. And that's a really, really nice way to present. And if I flick to my book, I've actually got um, a lot of specimens that were presented in envelopes that various people um, 
uh, gave uh, me in. And I, I have to say, when we were having a session at the Microscope Club, a couple of the guys who don't normally um, do uh, the macros said, oh, isn't it nice doing macros that are properly presented and dry? It, it's fun. It's so much easier dissecting them because they're, they're nice and um, uh, nice and big as, um, as, as well. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the glassine envelopes. Now, as far as the labelling goes, one of the things that I realised at the uh, Microsoft Club, we were doing so many specimens at the same time, what we needed, it said this, I said it was going to be like Blue Peter, um, we made like a, a little traveller up and what this traveller is, it's got the, a little space to punch out the bit that goes with the test tube, so I've just stamped that out um, with these hole punches. Um, I discovered these hole punches uh, when I was watching my wife do some crafting. Um, so these are crafting punches. They're usually available in lovely, am I allowed to say this, girl, girly shades of greys and pinks. They look ever so nice, but you can actually find some in black and grey. I think I had to get order those from the States. And I even got a bigger uh, uh, punch and uh, managed to punch out the label which I stick the uh, specimen body on. And now I'm left with this card which I filled in the details on and then when I stick it to the page you can see I've actually been able to write through I uh, trying to do this right through the holes so uh, I, it really really makes things nice and orderly and at the microscope club we found this this system worked really rather well because we had so many people working at the same time and we might have you know half a dozen specimens in our um, test tube tray at the same time so we really need to keep things in uh, um, in order so I would say that the critical thing to do when you're collecting any specimens of moss for the uh, for the likes of uh, people like me and others to dissect an ID for you it's really uh, dry the specimen and pop it in a really nice envelope if you're not going to do um, uh, the, the, the pinning uh, in a nice envelope. If it's a micro moth, the problem is there is that these envelopes can be a bit, bit harsh. The, the moth can get a bit bashed around. And so we, um, we really say in that case, it's better to use a small container um, and that it avoids rubbing as much off the wings of the, the moth. So on the micros, I mean, probably before we did the dissection, we'd, we'd look at the moth, uh, particularly look at the features around the, the head and the eyes, and that would tell us what family it was. And then we, we get it down to, to quite a small range of um, possibility of species or family before we did the ID. And if the specimen isn't well prepared, then um, that's, that's impossible. Um, and just a thought, somebody said to me, you know, well, how much does it actually cost to do this? And I, I started to add up the, um, the costs of all the bits and pieces. So for a macro moth, which you've set, the, the pin is nearly 10p. Um, uh, you very quickly um, get up with all the chemicals that you've used, you very quickly get up to around a pound a specimen um, to do a dissection. Um, at the Microscope Club, the uh, Leicester and Rutland Wildlife Trust very kindly uh, contributed towards the cost of all the materials that we were using, which was absolutely brilliant. But it was only when I sat and sort of back and actually started adding things up, I realised gosh, you know, you, you end up spending quite a, a bit of money doing this. And this is the reason that some of the people doing the dissections actually charge a nominal fee for doing them. It's, it's not that they're being muddy or anything like that. It's, it's, it's just that all the chemicals and the bits and pieces all 
at, at, add up. And so, you know, some sort of nominal fee to cover a volunteer doing this is, is a really nice thing to do. That's kind of covered what I wanted to talk about, um, um, you know, pre presenting um, moth specimens. Has anybody got any questions? There are so few, you can unmute your micro, uh, microphones at this point. I've just got a couple of things to share, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first one is, um, I, I'm quite proud of myself because I've been papering uh, specimens um, uh, this year. I collect all the caddis flies from my uh, uh, moth trap because the county recorder, I, I, I refuse to do dipter, I'm sorry, it's just a, a, a tax on too far. Uh, but Ray Morris, the county recorder, is always happy to receive caddis fly specimens and I collect them all up and I send them off to him at the end of the year and then he tells me what I've had in my moth trap and he's happy because it extends his records because uh, caddis flies very often are attracted to light. And so I've been papering mine this year. I was putting them in tubes. And as Paul says, the, the costs mount up. Whereas if you buy a roll of baking parchment, you can do hundreds and hundreds of specimens. And this is the, this is the little diagram of how to do it. And believe it, enough, uh, believe it or not, because I'm origamically challenged, uh, I have to look at the damn diagram every time I do <laughs> to remind myself how to fold it. I cut out all of the blanks. You have to remember the blank has to be an oblong shape rather than square. Um, and then I cut myself a bunch of blanks, uh, but then very often I have to look at the diagram to remind how to do it. So it's um, it's quite easy. So I don't know if you've got if you're on a computer, there you go. Press press print screen now. Take a screenshot if you want it. Um, I did find it. This isn't my diagram. I did find it online somewhere, so I'm I'm sure you can look it up. But it, as as Paul says, as long as the specimen is properly dried, uh, and, and even then, it, putting it in paper, you know, will help as long as you don't put it in a sealed container. Um, it, it's a much cheaper and, and very very space efficient way of of doing it. So there we are, papering. Um, so uh, everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the other thing I just wanted to do was to just talk about non non moth specimens because we did spe we did say specimens the, yes. this time not not just moths yeah so um, the first thing is um, uh, soft bodied um, uh, organisms generally speaking we keep them in seventy percent alcohol uh, rather than in um, uh, rather than dried. So spiders, for example, if you try and dry them, other than some of the very largest tarantulas that have got quite a robust cuticle, um, spiders just deform out of all recognition and you can't recognize anything. So soft bodied things like spiders are kept in alcohol. And then for handling those, um, uh, we, I, I use one of these under the microscope. So this is a this is an evacuated glass block. If you want to look this up, all, all the all the microscope suppliers uh, supply these. I think I I tend to get mine from NHBS, but uh, Watkins and Doncaster, you know, any any of the microscope suppliers supply them. You can't really see this here. I'm afraid it didn't show up very well, but there is there is alcohol in here. So you put your alcohol preserved specimen below the surface of the alcohol um, in, in, in these glass beads. And I'll have a bit more to say about these glass beads in a minute. Um, and the nice thing about the glass beads is that by adjusting the specimen, you can put them at exactly the right angle to show what features what features you want. So that's quite good. Um, harder bodied things, um, however, though I, I do tend to store dry. So when it comes to things like bugs, and Nicola asked me which is this is, so this is one of the graph elongated mirrored uh, grass bugs, so this is Stenodema. Um, so same thing, five centimeter petri dish, a level of uh, uh, glass beads, no alcohol now, just a dried specimen. But again, you can flip the specimen over and the glass beads just uh, hold the specimen at the perfect angle for photography or focus stacking or just viewing under the microscope or whatever it may be. Um, 
And the final thing is uh, for, um, I like Paul makes permanent slides, as he's shown you of some of his dissections. I tend not to make permanent slides. I tend to rely on photographs, but for alcohol pre preserved specimens, uh, the medium uh, I tend to use uh, is uh, this, um, mm -hmm. alcohol hand gel, 70% alcohol hand gel. Which, which it turns out, if, if you read the ingredients, it's a bit mysterious actually, um, but it's got, it's got gloop in it. I've never been entirely sure what the gloop in alcohol hand gel is, uh, but you'll all be familiar over the last few months of knowing that it, it does have this gloopy finish to it. Um, and again, it's a very good mounting medium for bits. You know, if you've got a leg, uh, you want to uh, take photographs of or something like that, you can position it at the perfect angle in hand gel. Now people also use glycerol um, for mounting specimens, but I think this is better. And the nice thing about this is if you've got a specimen preserved in 70% alcohol, you can whack it into the hand gel and you get no sort of mixing or anything because that's also 70% alcohol. And then when you finish uh, looking at it, you can put it back in alcohol and then the hand gel just, just goes away basically. You just, it just, just dissolves. Mm. So that, that's quite a nice, uh, a nice system. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, the, um, uh, the book that you really want is uh, this one. And it was Andrew Chick who um, I think we can attribute the idea of using the hand gel um, as he, he was the one with the idea. Uh, you know, sort of glycerin uh, gets everywhere. It's horrible yeah. to work with. Um, trust me, you do not want to use that. Uh, but as Alan says, using the, um, uh, the hand gel, um, I managed to get some uh, non-scented hand gel. I, um, I, I'm happen to be allergic to certain sorts of plant extract of it, including mint. So, um, and some of these things that say they contain lemon also seem to contain mint as well, which isn't very, very nice. So uh, that's a book that you uh, really want there. And um, yeah, where, where do you get the glass beads from then? Alan, other than I get, me. I get them from you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get them from a man I play badminton with. So, <laughs> so the, the so industrial so these glass beads is Ballotina, and you can buy a five or ten kilogram bag yeah. of these things really cheaply. But what do you do with it all? Well, um, it goes into the paint on line, for lining roads. It's the reflected bits in paint. So in the sacks that they're throwing away, there's enough of this stuff um, for, for us, you know, people to to use. So I've got a, a jar, um, and I'm quite happy. I'd normally say I'd, I'd give it to you at at the next meeting. So if anybody wants some um, offline, if you drop me uh, a line, we, you know, I, I I can send you some through the. Um, uh, through through the post, but you don't need um, very much. Somebody on Facebook asked me in one of the insect groups asked me uh, about a week ago about where do you get the glass beads from, um, and I didn't feel on Facebook I could say well you just email Paul Palmer, so um, <laughs> so I, I did I did look it up for him and um, that I, I you can find them if you search around, uh, but the minimum quantity I could find was was two kilograms. Which, which is, which is, I don't know how many lifetime supply two kilograms is, but it's more than one, that's for sure. Yeah. So you know, you you will you will make friends if you buy, and you know, it's only about they're only about five or ten quid for two kilograms of glass beads or so, and they'll last you like forever. Yeah. Uh, so you wind funny. up trying to get rid of the things. Yeah, this is what I mean. If we were actually having meetings, I'd bring along some little bags of, um, you know, I've got some polythene bags here, specimen bags. I bring bring along some bags, and you know you can you know, uh, to 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 give away. Um, but I've got a really large jar um, of them. So uh, any, anyway, um, I, I I can't supply the whole um, whole country. Uh, 
but uh, anyway, yeah. you, can, you can buy them. You can buy them. Yeah, if yeah, you, I, if, I'm more than happy to to, to forward them. Um, um, the other thing I was going to do, Paul, was was just run through my toolkit very briefly. No, go on then. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, just, Nicola, just, Nicola, just before that. Yeah. yeah. Can I just ask, Paul, does it matter whether the um, specimen containers are plastic or glass? Uh, well, if you're using alcohol, uh, need, need to be, well, I say, need to be glass, although these are... I, meant, I meant the ones that we deliver to you, you know, before you're processing well, them. I, I, I immensely prefer them to be papered, because then I know they're rarely dry. What, what, what happens is that if they're um, plastic um, or glass, you can get condensation in, and that's the... Yes. That, that's the real um, problem. If they're micro moths and you know, you, you're sure they're dry, it doesn't make much difference. But if you imagine the amount of water in a micro moth, which is what the problem is, is tiny yeah. compared yeah. to a macro. And also some of the macro moths have got a lot of fatty deposits as well, a lot of oil in them too, which presumably is yeah. something to do with the, fat, the, the way they store energy. Anyway, okay. but so yeah, yeah, I, I immensely prefer papered um, specimens, Nicola. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so um, briefly then, um, my toolkit. Um, so because we, we were talking about, um, I, I don't know whether we called this preparing specimens or handling specimens, but it's really sort of handling specimens. So uh, here's what I use. And I have to say a lot of this has come via Paul's instruction, so uh, he'll comment as well. So first thing is um, scalpel, small scalpel, always wind up using scalpels. This isn't the, the best one, but always wind up cutting bits um, off. Uh, very useful. Um, yeah, yeah, have one of those, yeah. <laughs> yeah, lots of those. Um, uh, Entomological forceps, um, also very, very fine entomological forceps, very, very useful for uh, picking bits up. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say there also these are sprung ones, and these have got a lot of resistance as you squeeze them, and they're great for handling de delicate bits. And these are locking ones, so they lock. And they're brilliant for actually holding, say, a cover slip or a microscope slide, something where you don't want to, um, to drop it. And don't laugh, but I also use, uh, these are jeweler's tweezers. So when I'm handling um, set specimens, my hands are really, really big. And I find that I can get a really positive grip on a needle um, yeah, pin and yeah, there's no vibration. Um, uh, if you've got smaller hands, you, you might might find these too big, but these are absolutely brilliant. But yeah, go on with the toolkit. Okay. Very, very useful. Um, small artist paintbrush. Um, don't, you don't need to buy the incredibly expensive sable bristles ones. These are, you know, this came in a pack of 12 for four quid from WH Smith or something. Just, just paint brushes. It can come in a range of sizes. They're, they're really useful for manipulating things, moving them around. And also anything bristly or hairy, it's quite easy to pick something up with a paintbrush as well because the bristles, the hairs catching the, uh, catching the brush. Uh, but the most useful thing of all, the thing I use more than anything, uh, again, for, via Paul originally, um, are uh, these doodads. Yes. So these um, are um, entomological pins um, of various grades. So I don't know if this shows up very well, but these are, I, can't, I think these are probably size one pins. Um, and these are size... Uh, size, I don't know if these are size double O or size triple O pins. I don't know if that comes across very, very clearly. Now, um, if you're Paul Palmer, what you do is you buy pieces of, of wooden doweling and you turn it very beautifully so that it has lovely ends. And then you, then you put, your, put your pin in it and you just bend it at an angle using a pair of pliers. Um, if you're me, you go to Wagamama and you nick their free chopsticks, their wooden chopsticks, <laughs> and you just stick it in the end of a Wagamama chopstick. But using these as a pair, 
for manipulating specimens in the glass beads, getting the angle you want, uh, and, and also for dissections. Most of my dissections are actually done with, with needles. And, and because you've got the handle, you can get a good grip on it and you get much better control. Rather than just trying to hold an entomological pin, uh, you know, using the handles are very, are, is the way to do it. So that, that, this, was, this was all via Paul's instructions. So you may have things to add to that, Paul. Yeah, um, yeah. You use your Hercule glue to, uh, to actually glue the pins in as well, because there's nothing more frustrating than carefully trying to do a, a dissection, and as you rotate the needle, it rotates in in the handle and doesn't go in the right place. Now the other thing is that there's different sorts of needles, so I'm holding that up to the super fine ones. Uh, this is a, a dissection. Uh, needle, that is a Watkins and Doncaster one. And this was a type of dissection needle I bought off um, eBay, actually. There's clearly this guy who turns darts, so he also makes what he calls um, dissection needles. But the wonderful thing about these is that the point is very blunt. Now, why that's wonderful is that if you're trying to set moths um, and insects, you, you have to manipulate the bits without piercing them. So you want sharp needles for dissection, but also sometimes you want blunt needles as well, because those you, you kind of drag them across the, the wing and you don't want to pierce it, you want to just manipulate things. So you end up with uh, actually a great range of different needles. Some you make yourself, some sharp, some blunt, because they all do different things. So that's I, 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 I have a little get. I have a little jar full of tools beside the microscope so I can just grab them and pull them out and stick them back in and then because otherwise they roll on the floor and go under the cabinet invariably. Okay, uh, okay. if we're sharing things like that, I have a whole tray <laughs> of, of, of bits. So this has got all sorts of different tweezers in um, pens for writing really fine things. These are glassine strips, which are uh, needles uh, uh, for, for, for setting uh, scalpels. I have, I keep stealing stuff from my uh, wife's crafting. This is the non-stick, non-slip pad that the crafters use when they're assembling um, uh, cards with multiple bits. Well, this is lovely stuff because if you are trying to write a label, the label doesn't slip while it's on it. So um, these start off as A4, but I guillotined them down, using my wife's guillotine, but she's out of earshot. I guillotined them down into some small squares. And uh, these are great because I've popped these under the microscope. Now this is quite a big one, but I can write really small labels um, just using the microscope um, as a uh, uh, well, and I mentioned um, pins. So this is an entomologist's pin tray. I can't tip it too far forward. And this has got what we call little pins, which are tiny short pins uh, used on the setting board and six types of um, pin uh, for uh, different gauges for, for different size insects. And uh, I also have in here, a, um, a little box of other pin sizes, including the really, really tiny pins that you need for uh, piercing a, um, a micro moth. So that right at the start of this talk, I showed you the um, uh, beautiful plume and that was pinned with a really fine needle and somebody said, well, how do you do it? Well, you do it with one of these pairs of tweezers under the microscope because it's so small. Um, but it's funny, you, you kind of um, uh, get used to it. Now, the other tool I don't think you've mentioned yet, which is a really important tool, is a pair of um, micro scissors as well. But I bet you've got a pair of these. Yeah, you have. Um, because uh, you need these really tiny scissors for snipping some bits, um, some bits off. 
And these are all available um, from um, you know, the main entomological suppliers, um, NHBS, Watkins and Doncaster, uh, the Czechos, back in um, Entosphinct, there's some German companies as well. Um, they all, all supply these things and they're, I don't know, they're, they're wonderful to work with. But also keep an eye out um, in the, um, the crafters tools like these punches. So the tools that the hobby crafters use are terribly similar to these tools as are the tools used by the you know, people who make jewellery at home as well. They, they've got some really useful different sorts of pliers and tweezers that they use. So I, I always enjoy having a browse in those, those shops. The, the only thing is, is that all the paper crafting stuff, a lot of that comes from America, no problem with that. But the Americans go for a very restricted set of colors that seems to be pink, gray, lemon, you know, <laughs> never black or chunky, always these, the, these lovely uh, delicate colors. So um, but if you get some nice fluorescent day glow ones, it means you're less likely to lose them when you put them down somewhere. Well, they're, they're, they're less likely to go walkies at Microscope Club, aren't they? Yeah. Not that anything ever goes walkies at Microscope Club. That, I didn't mean anything by that, but it's, it's pretty obvious who they are. Oh, I guess it's also worth mentioning that um, that's a point by uh, what you need for labelling. Uh, these, this is a, a 0 0.03 uh, rotaring black liner pen. So this make is yes, yeah, a uni pen, uni pin fine liner. I always call these rotarings, but they're not made by rotaring anymore. And the important thing about these is that they've got pigment ink in rather than a dye. Uh, a pigment will last uh, pretty much forever because it's a mineral colour and a, uh, um, a dye, maybe what they call fugitive, particularly red colours, and, and, and fade. So if you're labelling things, you want to use um, pigment pens. And even the paper, he says, reaching, reaching around. Actually, the paper used by the paper crafters, again, is brilliant because it's acid-free paper. And what you want is good quality archival paper and the paper crafters only actually use good quality archival papers. So you want to use um, acid free paper, otherwise it, it, the acid in it will turn the paper brown and, and actually attack anything that's, that's stuck to it. So all the bits of paper and card I've got to punch these from uh, are all acid free. And I guess the final thing for, for actually gluing labels onto slides. Um, I, I, I actually use art, art glitter. Again, one of the really popular um, paper crafters adhesives and it works really well. It's a stick paper to glass, which is what you want to do for your microscope slides. And then um, you mentioned I produce um, my microscope slides. He's having a rummage around here. One of the difficult things to do is to drop cover slips onto microscope slides and this is a little vacuum suction tool and it's actually an electronics tool. I spent many years in the electronics industry and you use these for picking up very small microchips and they're perfect for handling um, the lift, very, really delicate little cover slips as well. So that's another tool in my toolbox and again everybody who hadn't seen these before at microscope club then immediately went out and bought them <laughs> because it's so so fiddly trying to drop um a microscope uh, cover slip what, what what's that called? what what would you look for if you wanted to buy one of those paul uh, a vacuum yes vacuum pickup tool something like uh, that that so um you know what i'm just going to very quickly uh, go on to, I bet you can get it on Amazon uh, any, anywhere. Um, so I'm just going on to the Amazon website. Uh, yeah, I've uh, just gone um, uh, on, on to Amazon and I found it as a 
Mini IC pickup tool, vacuum sucking pen, two ninety nine. No. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. It's, it's a very low quality one, but it's good enough, and it makes what was a difficult job really easy. So you can see that Alan and I are both uh, have interesting little toolkits with lots of little bits in. Um, yeah, uh, mine's growing rather bigger than a jam jar's worth. But I have got a jam jar's worth of tools that I take along to Microscope Club for everybody to um, to, to borrow. Well, my, my problem is I've got restricted space around my microscope, so it, it's it's handy just to have this beside the microscope, and then when, without taking your eyes away from the eyepieces, you can just pick things up and shove them back in the jar, and it's you know it's quite useful. Yeah. Uh, I, I I'm very lucky that I have um, a lot of space. So this is the the home <clears throat> home office and as you can see I've got the the microscope um, here um, lighting's really um, important and I've got a a, a ring light a, a, around so that's um, that's the new microscope the um, there's a second microscope on the way uh, which is the uh, specialist digital microscope and that will do the really high magnification work but I'm really really lucky in having so much space and a, and a huge um, desk to uh, work on. Although I'm afraid if you were to pay a visit, you'd know instantly which is my desk and which is Leslie's desk. <laughs> well, and, and, and a huge non-vibrating space, you should say as well, just a nice stable surface that doesn't bounce up and down as we've discussed previously. Uh, yes, yes. So this in this house, this used to be the, um, the garage. And it's a sort of, sort of a pseudo suspended floor. So they put um, uh, wood ac laths across the floor and then they put um, floor and gate grade chipboard down uh, as well. So it's actually quite a nicely insulated, as you say, vibration free space. So yeah, we're, we're incredibly lucky to, to have this space as a home office and um, a working space to to do these sorts of things in. Okay, so is, has anyone got any questions or anything they want to ask or anything that... Um... Yeah. I wonder if I can ask about the... Thank you very much for all the information, thank you. I wonder if I can ask about those cover slips over the slides. Do you use them in, with everything, even quite a solid object you have to cover on the, for the slides, or is it just small specimens uh, that are more in the liquid, if you like? <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, uh, I, I, I cheat a bit. Yes, I'm just going to move, uh, move over and grab the... Ah, here it is, the microscope um, a slide box. So, oh, it smells, uh, smells lovely, actually. I love the uh, smell of the <laughs> um, I, You don't get high or addicted to it, do you? Uh, and, and anyway, I have um, several sorts of cover slips, but these little ones, um, so you can get the, the bigger square ones, um, I find, though, that the smaller round ones, they're much more expensive because it's more difficult to make them. But there's a lot more tolerance in placing them. But you said about the, the big specimens. Well, what I do, I have two slides. Um, and you probably would, you can maybe just see that there's a dip in that one. So this, this slide has a dip in. And um, uh, they're, they're, these are actually quite a relatively cheap one made by Bresser. So there's a really expensive process where they grind out the dip. But Bresser seem to be doing something. I suspect what they're doing, while the glass is hot, they're, they're, they're putting pressure on it and making this, this dip. And that's super because you can put the bigger specimens in there and then you can drop a cover slip on. So you've got the, the depth because you're absolutely right that if something's too solid, your cover slip tends to go at an angle and you really want to use a cover slip. Um, it's fine on the microscope that I've got here, the uh, dissecting microscope or biological microscope. 
uh, because it's got a huge working range. But the moment you get on to wanting to you look at things much higher magnification, your, 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 your glass, your, your lenses are getting really close to the, um, the object, the subject. So you really do need a cover slip. And this is a good compromise. So again, I, I actually buy these on um, Amazon, although you can get them from the specialist suppliers. And then if you've got something even thicker, you can get um, uh, microscope slides with shims. Now these are two millimeter shims. And the reason why there's a lot of black stuff around the edge, not very neatly at that. That's me, I'm afraid. So what I've done, I've used some um, uh, cement. I've probably got it here somewhere. I've got some um, some uh, ringing cement, and I've actually, which is waterproof and seals it, because what I wanted to do was put a lot of liquid in there, and we were looking for tardigrades. So I wanted to use a much higher volume of liquid. And then I use this in conjunction with, he says, looking around with one of these large cover slips. And so <clears throat> I had something which we could search quickly with the binocular microscope. And if we found something interesting, move over to the uh, um, compound microscope. Um, because it had a cover slip on, we could get to quite high magnifications without um, having to worry that we were going to get the lens um, back. So anyway, I really do recommend getting your hands on some of these dipped um, slides, these, these con uh, concave um, slides. I use them on all the macro um, permanent settings that I've, I've made. And then he said, oh, here, here's the rest of the bits. And then um, because it hasn't squashed things as flat, that's when you need then to, to do um, stack focus um, micro uh, photography. Because if everything's squashed really flat, you could probably get away with a single photograph. Well, because it's concave, yeah, you, you, you've got a, a, a too big a, big a range for a single photograph. So what you need to do then is to do really move over to the stack focusing and uh, you know stack a set of uh, photographs and you, you get some really good images. Now you, you saw how clear the images were from this microscope and I'm still working up to how to get the best photographs. I'm, I'm afraid I've got very busy with some other things at the moment but um, I've already demonstrated to my own satisfaction that uh, this setup is now taking some amazing photographs as single photographs. And I'm hoping to extend that <coughs> to, the, to the stack boat photography, but that's something else. So anyway, that's, uh, that's all my microscopy bits that are here. And it includes some lovely things like uh, purple nail varnish, uh, ring the slides with those. You know what, yeah, you do know what slide ringing is, I, I Okay, um, he says reaching over to here. Well, while Paul's reaching over, let me give you an alternative. The other, the other alternative to um, uh, the, the aluminium shims um, is uh, you can just use cap washers uh, from B&Q will, will also work as well to give you a little well to put uh, liquid in on a slide. Or even a live specimen, small live specimen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So slide ringing is where you put um, this um, uh, uh, sealant around the edge of the the cover slip, and you have to do that with a circular slide because I have a grandson now. And we decided to move all the chemicals and dangerous stuff high out of reach now before it was an issue. And this is a thing called a ringing stage. And what happens is that your slide goes on the ringing stage. I got it approximately like this and this spins. And so I'm going to do this like this. So with a paintbrush, you, you rest your hand on here and 
you spin it around and you can put mm. sealant around the edge. Now you do that when you've got a, um, a mountain that isn't permanent so, and it needs sealant. So if you use a water-based mountain, um, something like this, this is a water-based mountain, um, it's easy to work with because you don't have to desiccate the, um, the, the, the specimens like you have to do with your parallel, but the slide isn't as permanent. It, 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 it can degrade over time unless you really seal it well. Now the Victorians were um, past masters at this and they would use two or three colours on their ring slide, almost like a signature. So if you go to an old antique shop and find some of these old slides, you'll see that they've done beautiful patterning with two or three or more colours mm. and some gold colour as well. So the slides look beautiful. Um, if you use it, your apparel, you don't need to, to do that, as I say. But what you do need to do is make sure that the slide has, yeah, the specimen has been properly desiccated. Otherwise, you'll get a sort of clouding which was happening to some of my mounts. So what I do now, if I'm making a permanent slide with apparel, I will leave the slide, um, this, the bits overnight in 100% alcohol once I've desiccated them before preparing the next stage. And then when I've got the specimen in a glob of um, uh, apparel, which is this uh, sort of resinous substance, I then leave it for perhaps another 12 hours so that um, any bubbles of alcohol disappear and then finally I'll drop the cover slip on. And you, you can see how fussy it gets, which is why the alternative of using something like the alcohol to make a temporary slide and taking some really good photographs and then preserving the bits is actually incredibly attractive because it just takes so long to do a really good permanent slide. I would only tackle so, one permanent slide at a time. Going, going back to your question, Farhan, um, if, if you've got a, a wet specimen in, in some sort of liquid mountain, you tend to use a cover slip on it. If it's a dry specimen, uh, like a whole insect or a leg or something like that, you, you tend not to use cover slips on, on dry specimens. Mm. Was, that, was that what you were meaning? What? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that, that is, but it, it's great because I didn't realise there's so many other things out there. So it's actually quite good. It's, it's, the fall is covered a great deal. But yes, I guess that's what I meant because I'm still at the sort of beginning of trying to use things on slides. And it's a long time since. And the only work I've done with microscopes was a very small sort of cellular level that I've used caps for. And I just didn't know whether we do need them with this sort of zoom. So yes, you both sort of, you, yes, you both answer my question now. Thank you. Oh, that's, um, that, that's, that's, that's perfect. I do recommend that book by um, Andrew Chick though. That's, that is relatively new, that book. And it's a really nice summary of, uh, of techniques and chemicals that you might want to try using. That's great, thank you. And does anybody else want to um, ask anything? Um, yeah. Can I ask, because most of my specimens are really sort of um, dry, dead things I've found rather than anything I've collected. So um, obviously that, that can mean they're quite sort of desiccated sort of initially. Um, so, at the moment, I just have lots of dead specimens stuck in whatever container I happen to find to stick them in. And so I've got a whole collection of those which I need to, to do something with. But um, if, so really, I'll be looking at some point actually setting them and pinning them and doing something so that they're sort of kept in a better state than they are now. Um, so, but if they're, they've dried out, Presumably, they're not necessarily in in a good position for for pinning. And do they need? Would they need relaxing as such before you do anything with them? And if so, how do you go about doing that? Um, the old books have got lots of advice on um, relaxing. So basically, you can just use sort of water and uh, a sponge, but you can't leave stuff too too long. So. 
uh, you probably only, if you're going to relax stuff so that you can try setting it, you, you need to get the moisture in. So once you, um, so you put them on this sort of damp cloth or what have you. I've got, I can, okay, disappearing up here, somewhere in here. Oh yeah, here it is. You can buy uh, relaxing fluid, which um, buy less from people like Watkins and Doncaster. So this is essentially water. I think it's got a bit of borax in as a bit of a disinfectant to discourage mold growing. And what you would do is put that in a, um, you know what, something like a clip lock container would be brilliant with some paper or some sponge at the bottom that's just moistened. And then I, these days, I'd put a layer of something like this on top so the specimens aren't actually touching, you know, the wet bits. So they're in the humid atmosphere. Um, and I do something like this rather than cotton wool, which some of the books say, because things can get tangled in cotton wool and it's fragile enough already. So this is just a bit of non-stick, you know, non-slip stuff. You, you, you could figure something out, out similar, you know, with um, perhaps a, um, say, a, a, an extra layer of paper towel or something like that. And then I'd leave it in... Uh, there for perhaps 48 hours, no more. And then I try to do the setting. But to be honest with you, um, setting a relaxed specimen isn't as easy as setting a fresh specimen. But you will, you, you can do it and you, and you will find that you can move things um, around. And again, I think the advice I give to you would be to buy some entomological pins uh, rather than using dressmaking pins because the dressmaking pins are often plated and they you can get like um, a reaction to the metal whereas the stainless steel that never happens um, it, it, it's it's easier working with but any, anyway um, oh and if they're tiny things what you need diving in You'll need some bits of this. Gosh, I'm going to spend ages putting stuff away. So this is this um, uh, uh, little bits of foam. I know, well, why is this, this foam? I, I don't know what it is. You buy it from these suppliers. So you can stick the small things on the, um, the foam. So that's what's happened here. So the insects stuck to the foam and then I put a big pin through the foam and then the, uh, the labels are on the, the big pin. And the thing that's in my hand is a thing called an insect examination stage. I think there's somebody probably somewhere who makes these things. They're lovely because you can rotate things around and under the microscope and push it in and out. So under the microscope, you can get just the right angle without actually often even taking the specimen off the, um, the, the little bit of foam. So small things, but use a tiny pin and a bit of foam. Big things, you know, pin um, directly. And then if you're using your microscope, something like this. Um, it wasn't particularly expensive when I bought this. I've had this probably for 20 years. Um, but it's, it's, it's exactly what you need for peeking at things under um, un under the uh, dissecting microscope. So yeah, you keep finding all these sorts of um, things and you know over the years I found out about these things and one of the motivations for doing the microscope club in the first place was that it's taken me years to find out about this stuff and um, you know the microscope club we've been sharing ideas and I've learned so much you know, from the relatively short time we've, we've run it, I, I've learned so many things. And other people I know have said the same uh, thing. So that's given you a useful idea. Um, Brilliant. Yeah, I'm re really pleased. Thank you very much. Can I also ask, have you got any hints and tips on other things that you can stick things? At the moment, I've got, embarrassingly, a load of uh, Norse stock cube things which are just just basically something to stick bits in until I get round to doing it 
Is, does anybody use um, all sorts of easily available things that? Uh, I, I keep buying stuff on eBay like these. Oh, little pots, yeah. Yeah, li li loads of little pots, things. And it's the really sports. tiny things that, you know, you just want uh, so minute, but just having something to yeah. pop them in. Um, I, yeah, I you... tend to use these. These are uh, polycarbonate uh, micro centrifuge tubes. Uh, they they come in they come in a range of sizes from two mil downwards to the, this is one point five mil and there's point uh, four mil ones as well. Um, most of the stuff I work with tends to be teeny tiny. So these these are incredibly strong. You can stand on these and sometimes they don't break. So they they're great for posting. Uh, as well, because you can just slip them in an envelope uh, and and post them. But I but I use these for compact storage. Obviously, if you've got um, a macro moth, something much bigger, you need you need you know like the bigger tubes, it, the the pe things that people use for you know um, potting moths from moth traps and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But if if you're working with with teeny tiny stuff. Um, these these don't take up so much space, and you can buy you can buy racks to keep these in, so they're they're really handy. Yeah, I mean for things like these set specimens, this has survived um, uh, all these years in a tin. <laughs> and, uh, um, but this is great because um, you can get a whiff of some mothballs in there. I mean, these cake tins, this was a Christmas cake tin, um, but the papered specimens, you know, are well protected from knocks and bumps in there. When stuff was sent to me last year, gosh, it was last year as well, for dissection, um, the papered specimens were all in a clip lock, you know, food box. So they were really well protected in there. There was enough to stop them shaking around. So I do think, you know, some of these kitchen sorts of containers mm. are really, really useful um, uh, for that. And Alan, you, you said, oh, you can put the larger moths in different sorts of tubes, um, <clears throat> only if they're really, really well dried, papered them. You, we don't want um, them to um, Absolutely, <laughs> but you know. For, it makes Paul grumpy. <laughs> uh, um, well, yeah, but for posting, obviously papers are difficult. You need to protect them. Yeah. I, I, I often, if I send someone a specimen, you know, and it's only taking up the, the, the bottom fraction of the tube, um, what I generally do is put a piece of rolled up uh, kitchen towel in. Um, don't, please, don't use tissue, because mm. tissue is terrible for shedding fibres. Uh, and toilet roll sheds fibres as well. But kitchen towel, paper towel seems to be better. It doesn't seem to cover everything in fibres in quite the same way. So that's a bit better. Yeah. And that stops it then bouncing around inside the tube and getting damaged. The, um, the other thing worth considering is, I mean, this is an entomological storage box. This is a new one. This one's empty. Um, <clears throat> When you get them, the wood's unfinished. Again, you can buy these from the suppliers. Um, just use linseed oil on it. That's the traditional thing because then if you've got several, they, they don't slip. And if you have pin specimens, it gives you a really good space to um, uh, pin them. This is a big one, um, but you know they come in all sorts of sizes and you can even get small posting boxes as well, specifically designed for, for posting um, <clears throat> pin specimens. So again, if you go on to the big um, entomological supplier websites, uh, enjoy having a little bit of a browse at the, the bits and pieces because there's people just like us who spent time thinking, oh yeah, that would be, that would be really useful. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, for entomology, excuse me, my voice is starting to go. That's great. Thank you very much. That's probably a sign that we've been going for yeah. long enough. So if we don't have any more burning questions, uh, I'll stop the recording now. And thank you all for coming along. Hope it was useful. Uh, thank you to Paul. Uh, and we hope to see you again in the future.